Oh my gosh. <laughs> Mia. Hi, I'm such a dork. <laughs> I wanted to wait till that song was over before we started. <laughs> yes. You know, I love my little mix. So for everybody, if you haven't already, please put your favorite quote in the chat. Um, hopefully you have your books with you so you can put it in. So throughout the party, feel free to put it in the chat as we go along, anything comes up. Um, share your setup with Mia. It'll be so fun to look and see what drinks everybody's having, <laughs> what your backgrounds look like. Oh, you already know. Even though everybody can't be on camera. And so yeah. Grab your drink, grab your coffee, ask any questions you like in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, this is Maddie, by the way. I'll be keeping an eye out on the Q&A, kind of helping facilitate things, but we're about to get started, so it'll be fun. All right, so hopefully everybody can hear me okay. So we have our Host Shekinah Starks is a Massachusetts native, native and a proud mass hole. She is a producer, actress, and host who loves all things 80s pop and film. Shekinah has also hosted on many carpets for award shows such as the BET Experience, the NAACP Awards, and the Grammys. Recently, she has worked on Space Jam 2 and is wrapping up a web series. When she isn't working on production things, she loves skating, volunteering in the deaf community, and petting strangers dogs, who doesn't? <laughs> She's also a, a publicist on Mia's team um, and her role is the lead launch publicist. And then of course we have Mia, who is a writer, digital personality and content creator from Virginia Beach, Virginia. Her fiction and nonfiction writing has appeared in Huffington Post, California's Emerging Writers, Gardy Lou Magazine, Harness Magazine and so much more. She has over 18,000 followers and 2 million views on her YouTube channel, Yours Truly Mia, and a blog with the same name. She's also the creator of A Year of Lessons, the 365-day blog project, in which she has penned and accepted essays on life lessons every day for an entire year. Mia has delivered speeches in front of an assortment of crowds, including her university commencement. Go JMU! Um, <laughs> <laughs> She's also been the host for live events from TEDx gatherings to NBA arenas filled with sports fans. She's a host, TV host with After Buzz TV and TV Co. Mia is a proud graduate from JMU, James Madison University, if you're not familiar, um, where she majored in media arts and design with a concentration in digital video and cinema and minored in creative writing. Her dream is to educate, inspire others. Note to Self is her first book, and it's also self-published. So here we have Shay and Mia. <gasps> Yay! Oh my gosh. Okay, there's literally nothing worse than being on screen during your intro, because you're just like... I know, what do I do? What do I do with my face? But uh, also... That's me. <laughs> excuse the Beyonce that's blasting from my neighbors, but I feel like it sets a good ambiance, you know? Two baddies just conversing about what a baddie you are about <laughs> publishing your book. Um, I want to start with the toast, if everybody wants to put their drink. Yes! Oh my gosh. I'm trying a new... Oh wait, I have to pop it. Can I pop it with you guys? Go ahead! Oh my god, I'm scared. I hate popping things. Hold on. Oh my god, oh my god. Wait. <laughs> okay, it's coming, it's coming. I was about to be like, Dan, come help me. Wait, okay, it's coming, it's coming. I feel like I feel it. Okay. Oh, that was anticlimactic because I was just yelling the whole time. Look at you. Is we that are, Dan in the Yeah. Back? Do you hear? We have our in studio audience, it. Dan, who's literally also on the <laughs> webinar. Hilarious. Hi. Thank you, you guys. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And Maddie for the intro and Shay for moderating. I'm excited. I feel like we're all going to have a good time. So if everyone wants to hopefully drink up, cheers to oh. all of the notes that we needed to ourselves, to mm. a successful publication, and to trying things even when they seem scary oh yes cheers to that yay mm. okay I'm Andre. whack but <laughs> i'm so happy to be sitting here with you and to be talking about your book it's so crazy i got my book and not even kidding my hands were like shaking and it's so interesting hearing people talk about their babies you know what i mean the things that they pour their heart and their souls into and you hold the thing and you're like, damn, you really did that. That's, this is so amazing. 
Um, Thank you. When I received it, I was actually listening to the Brene Brown podcast. Yes. Um, she's been getting me through a lot, but I was listening to, um, which one was it? The Fuck It First, when she talks about failure, doing things regardless if you're scared. So here you are publishing a book. Um, what were you the most nervous about and how did you overcome your, fe- your fears of failing? Um, I think the thing I was most nervous about truly going into this was I didn't know if anybody would even want to read it. I don't know if people would want to buy it. Um, I just knew I've always wanted to write a book and it's been my dream since I was little. It was like the first creative endeavor I ever had was literally putting together coloring books on my, uh, my living room floor. My parents would literally go to the printing shop and print it and we bind it. And it's so funny because actually on my signing day, my neighbor, um, they, they came over. I grew up babysitting them and they came over and they're like, I still have your coloring book from when you were little and now you have a real book. Like, this is crazy. So I've always wanted to write a book, but as you know, I've worked in all types of media, like visuals, written word. And I always get nervous because I feel like people like, I don't know. I think books are like hip again, but I just was like, I don't know how many people are really going to want to buy it. I guess it's a book of quotes. So it's accessible, but um, yeah, I just didn't know how it'd be received. Um, And I think the other thing I was most nervous about was the fact that it really is my life. It's, it's truly like I say on the back of the book, like these are stories like this. I've lived all of these. So it's really nerve wracking to know that people could read them and then sort of like ascribe their own opinions or, you know, be like, okay, well maybe that person did that, or maybe this happened then. Um, and that was kind of nerve wracking to me, especially in the love section of this book. Yeah. (laughs) Um, which, yeah, that was, that was super nerve wracking. Yeah. So. That's amazing. Well, it showed this book is just super vulnerable and honest. Um, how did it feel compiling these quotes, knowing that you were like actually pouring your your soul into this how do you how are you feeling knowing that people who you know and love people who you don't even know are kind of rereading your most interpersonal thoughts it makes me it makes me excited mostly because um well I'll say this first my friend Tyler who she's in the acknowledgments she um I had a few friends that kind of it was like a co-collaboration to edit this and when she finished reading it she was like I love it I love that it's short form I love that it's punchy and she was like what do you think about, you know, making an essay before each section, kind of talking about your experience with love, people, life, self, so then the quotes would make more sense. And I started doing it, and I started typing essays, and I was like, this, it doesn't seem right just because I wanted people to see themselves in the quotes, Mm -hmm. and it felt like I was making it about me, and even though these are my stories, this is not about me. It's supposed to be about whoever's reading it, um, and so I didn't like that, but then it's funny cause then I ended up making them marketing materials. So they're on my Instagram, but that's kind of how that came about because I was like, I don't think they have a place in the book. It just seems weird. It makes it about me. Um, but I would say, um, yeah, I guess the feeling I had writing all of them, I, I don't know if I really had a feeling. I think it was just to, to sum it all up. It was cathartic because I didn't know these would become a book. Like I literally, would just be walking to class and, would, and a thought would come to my head and I'd be like, oh, and I'd get my phone and I'd like scramble and like jot it down. And, I, and you guys, some of you guys have probably like seen all my q and So you know, like the book basically started because I had 20 different phone notes in my phone because I'm a note junkie. And I just, I'm also an organization junkie. So I was like, I, there's, they're too spread out. I got to put them all together. So I put them in a note called Note to Self, which is how I got the title of the book. Um, and so it was just cathartic for me. Like I wrote them when I was angry or when I was sad or when I was like, you know, you need to woman up, you need to woman down. Like they're, they're pick me up. So they're also like tear me downs as I call them. So, um, yeah, I didn't know. I didn't really have feelings while writing them. I didn't know it'd become a book. I didn't know it'd become like a public thing other than it being maybe in a blog post and being like the start of something. Um, so that was really it. I just, it was just kind of like a journal at first, but compiling them, it, I realized the power of, these individual sayings. And I was kind of nervous it wouldn't be enough. Like I I thought that maybe um, no one would be interested in reading a book of quotes. And like, who am I? Like Cheryl Strait has a book of quotes because she's Cheryl Strait. But Mia Brabham, what, she doesn't have business writing a book of quotes. Um, Yeah, but she's Mia, like, I was like, I have no business doing this, but um, But here I am, am. yeah. So that was a long-winded way to say, yeah, it is just a journal, it's cathartic. I think that's amazing. Um, Having the pleasure of being on the publicity side and helping you, trying to 
navigate how to launch a book during a pandemic, oh um, during a revolution. Like it, it was kind of tricky. Um, but what was the hardest? What was the hardest part for you while trying to launch your book in the middle of really shaky and unpredictable times? Oh my gosh, that's a really good question. Um, I mean everything. It it's funny the journey of this book by itself, but then also in this time frame because this book really came about because of the pandemic. Um, I I always feel bad because people would text me and be like, "Says you wrote a whole book during a pandemic, like what?" And I'm like, "No, don't get the wrong ideas. Like yeah. you shouldn't all be writing books. You shouldn't be all creative. Like don't beat yourself up." I just wanted to take advantage of the time I knew I'd never have again. Like I was able to do all of this because <laughs> I'm unemployed. Like yeah. it was, it was easy to do all of it, but it's really started because when the pandemic started, I wanted to give back. I've always tried to be phil- philanthropic in all that I do in whatever ways I can, but I didn't have money, but I wanted to donate. So I originally was looking at COVID charities and I was looking at like Feeding America and all these big charities. And then I was kind of like, Oh, this, you know, this could be good. This could be helpful. This could be my way to, way to raise money. It was never about the money. I just always wanted to write a book and then I wanted to give back. And so this kind of happened. Um, but then I started looking at it and then there was like, I remember there was like some big golf fundraiser with like Tom Brady and Tiger Woods and they raised over a million dollars for feeding America. And I was like, okay, listen, like good cause. Yeah. I was like, these, I was like, they don't need more money. What is my book going to do? This is not helping. So I started looking at local orgs. Um, and then I found girls for a change, which we're donating the money to, um, from the first week since about two weeks, so we'll do it from that first week. And it's really exciting. I really love all that they do and they lift up young girls of color. And that was literally before this revolution started. Like I was thinking all of that before all of this and then literally everything with like Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, um, everything just popped off. And, you know, the team is pretty, like we have a really diverse team. We have people of all backgrounds, like Latina, you know, we're black, um, Maddie's Asian. So we have people from all backgrounds, but I think we really, Shay and I had to go through this together and we've had many conversations. Like I wasn't going to push the book back. Um, it didn't feel right. Even as a black creator, clearly all of a sudden everyone's following black creators now, which is like, I've gotten so many followers. That's weird to navigate. Um, but I know I would, I could do it because, um, you know, black joy is a form of resistance. So I knew I could publish it, but I was nervous because I was like, I don't, think it's like read the from people it doesn't seem like the right yeah. time to do it but then I was like okay I just got to push forward and then even then I didn't think of it I didn't think when I when I finally decided not to push the book back it wasn't because I was like you know I get to like I'm black like I can do it at this time because I can do whatever I want it was more of like honestly individually those two weeks were some of the darkest two weeks of my life like we called each other I was crying to you um and I really had to focus on it so that I didn't go down a hole again because I was yeah. in a really dark place for two weeks during this. And I honestly wasn't even going to do the essay series. So really this book, that final push was me literally trying to get my head in a space that I, I just didn't spiral. So funny how that came about. Um, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> what a beautiful thing. And yeah. um, there's one quote in the book that I really, really like. The detours are okay. They're almost better than the recommended route and they're often more interesting you always get to where you were meant to end up anyways. So I have a hard time when things don't happen the way that I want them to or plan. Mm -hmm. Um, Considering the past few months, I I fall into pieces. You know, I definitely crumble underneath that. Um, But adulthood and COVID, all of this is hella scary. How do you remind yourself to trust the process? And how would you recommend others like me (laughs) to continue to trust the process too? Oh my gosh. it's so weird because I only think we can, we can only inspire people so much, right? Like you have to find everything within yourself. And so, um, funny, I say that literally wrote a whole book trying to inspire people. But, um, (laughs) I think the biggest way to just do what you need to do is just focus. I guess I'll refer back to a a book or a quote actually from the beginning of the book where I talk about not using your superpowers or not using your gifts is like not using your superpowers for good. I just think like, why waste all those ideas you have, the energy you have, the creativity you have, like we only get so much time on this earth. So I'm trying to just take advantage of it every minute I get. And I give myself time to breathe and I give myself time to rest. But um, I don't know. I think I'm just personally motivated by knowing that I have something to offer and I'm slowly becoming more confident in that because I wasn't always confident in it. And I just, I'm lucky to have like great parents. Hi, mom and dad. They're watching. Um, who believed in me. (laughs) What's up? 
um, it, it's helped to have, you know, two amazing parents believe in me, but I think part of it is just knowing, um, that you have something to offer and, uh, confidence is tricky. You really have to pretend you really do. Like you really just can't be confident all the time. Um, but I think if you kind of just muster it up when you don't feel like it, it kind of helps. I don't know. Did I answer the question at all? I feel yeah, like I just kind of like going like, Okay. Um, so with that, with confidence, I think, um, being a woman, being a woman of color, it's definitely often super tricky feeling imposter syndrome often. Mm. Um, and how did, how did you manage to continue to push forward when you felt like, what am I doing? Am I writing this during a pandemic? Um, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, how do you continue to encourage yourself and be like, you know, screw that imposter syndrome. I deserve to be here just as much as everybody else does. Oh my gosh. That's a, a really good question again. You're asking the hard hitting question. You guys. really are. And I just <laughs> truly, she's just coming for me um, in the best way possible. I just think I try, I try not to focus on the external. I really try hard not to. And I think um, I really just, you just have to know that you have a story to tell. And you just have to let that guide you and you, you cannot afford to focus on anything else. Um, and also just surround yourself with great people that, that literally hype you up like we're doing right now. That's it. Um, but yeah, I just think take advantage of every opportunity you get and even time you have to take an opportunity of um, the time that you're given. So yeah. That's great. Yeah. Tribes are super important. And I think we look to each other for strength, for guidance, but sometimes people don't know what they're talking about. Um, you know, how, what is the worst piece of advice you've ever gotten from someone else? <gasps> you don't have to name no names. No shade. <laughs> Drag them. Um, what, okay. What I mean, I, I can't think of like a specific, gosh, I can't think of a specific worst piece of advice I've gotten because I've gotten a lot of bad pieces of advice. Mm. Like, for example, it's been the best three and a half years with Dan ever. And someone told me not to date my coworker that that was a really bad idea. So, I mean, there's little, there's just little bad things, but I think the, the worst is probably, and maybe it was more of me and my inner critic, but I think, and it, it wasn't an actual piece of advice I think I got from a lot of people. I just think it was, um, it was what, I'm trying to think of how to say this. When I lived in LA and when I wanted to come back to the East Coast, I think a lot of people discouraged me, whether yeah. straightforward, direct, or through their body language, they're like, well, what? Like their questions, like well-meaning questions, but kind of just believing that I couldn't be successful anywhere except LA. Yeah. And um, I think that was the worst. It wasn't direct advice, but I think that energy was the worst energy I received to this day because I went to Jamie with people rooting me on. I moved to DC with people rooting me on. I moved to LA with people rooting me on. I did not have everybody rooting me on when I moved back. And it feels good to know that I literally wrote a book, which has been one of my dreams forever. And I have a TV show that I'm gonna be on tonight that is literally my own show. So, and I'm getting paid for it. I've never been paid really for hosting um, other than when I actually came to DC when I moved back and I was working with the NBA here. So it's and just interesting. Happen. Literally I left LA and it's like things I'm th like thriving, like things, God has literally put things in my lap since I took the leap, which is why I love the second to last quote of the book is like one of my favorites. And it's like, um, when you're brave, when you, you know, take risk, when you step out on a limb, where you're brave, that's where good things will find you always. Mm -hmm. And I was brave enough to take the leap, not knowing and nothing but good things have come out of it. So yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, well, I think I have one more question before the Q&A. Um, of all the quotes that have come from the lessons you've learned in your everyday experience, what was the hardest lesson you've had to learn as a young adult? Oh my gosh. Okay. The hardest lesson? Let's go. As a young adult. Or even a lesson you're learning now and you're just like, maybe I'm just not learning this. <laughs> gosh. I think really that you just can't be everything to everyone. Mm -hmm. I tried, I grew up a, a people pleaser and I still am. And, um, I think I was, 
I used to, I used to th- say I was a doormat. My mom will always tell me, you were never a doormat. You always had some sass. And I was like, yeah, but that's different than like letting people take advantage of me. And I do feel like through in little ways, I let people take advantage of me or I was too soft or I didn't speak up a lot of my life. Um, and I think now, especially with this revolution happening and just amongst other things, I feel like I've changed. I think I've found my voice a lot more. And when I speak up, not everyone is telling you to speak up. A lot of people are trying to silence you um, in little ways and gaslight you. And I think I'm learning how to take that and know that just because I'm not soft as I used to be and just because I am strong, that's not a bad thing because I've had a lot of people tell me, you know, that it's like they don't, they don't want to see people transform and find themselves. And I've really had to for myself be like, yes, I have evolved. Like I have become stronger. That's intimidating people. That's scary to some people. I seem different to some people, but yeah. I'm confident in that. And if people don't like that, then I just, I have to know that it's okay. And not everyone's going to like me and people can start liking you and stop liking you and vice versa. So i um, really just trying to be my own best friend. <laughs> yeah. I what I'm trying to do. At some point we were talking about uh, when you had said that you were so kind, I mean, excuse me, you were so nice. Mm -hmm. I see myself, I think that's why I love you so much. I feel like we definitely mirror a lot of really good qualities and really, and qualities that we're both trying to work on, but wanting to be nice and wanting to please other people. But niceness is performative, you know, like Mm. I'm nice because I don't want to ruffle feathers. I'm nice because I don't want to stir the pot. It's all from kindness. Like you are a kind person and no matter the ways that you change, that kindness will always shine through. But like Mm. leave the niceness at the door. Niceness is so performative. You don't need to be nice for anybody. You need to be kind to people and kind to yourself. So, Oh my gosh. Uh, Find a book next. I'm waiting. uh, uh, No, but I will be moving on to the Q and a portion. Um, We had the participants hop in our web chat. Um, and we want to see the questions you guys would like to ask Mia. Give me one second while I pop them up. Okay. I feel so bad. I don't want to get anyone's name wrong. I hate when people get my name wrong. So please excuse me. Jave. Yes. Yes. What a nice name. Listen, we on a roll now. I love you, boo. <laughs> Javay said, what was the catalyst for you to actually follow through on this dream? Publishing a book is no small thing, and you did it. Um, I think, so we kind of touched on it in that first question that you asked, but really just knowing, gosh, do I literally want nothing but to sit on my couch for a month and watch TV and keep watching Netflix and catch up on all my shows and movies and have a movie marathon with Dan, but... I knew that in such an awful time, this pandemic is awful for so many reasons. I knew that I'd never get a chance like this again, at least that I know of. I mean, we don't know what's coming to us in life. And I was like, wow, I've lost all my gigs. I actually have time to do the thing that I want to do that I've always wanted to do. And so the catalyst for that literally was time. And this time specifically where I knew that I wouldn't get it back. And I had to fight wanting to really just like, relax. I think that like the first two weeks of the pandemic, I was like relaxing, but then after that, I was like, all right, you got to get up. Like you got to sit at your desk every morning. You got to compile this. You got to re- you got to edit it. You got to revise it. Um, and so, yeah, I just knew I wouldn't get a time like this again. So I think that was the, the big catalyst for me. Super strategic. We love to see it. Um, Bradley asked, you live a pretty open and public life. What is something that you took a while to talk about publicly? If you feel comfortable saying, what do you feel like you shouldn't be open about? What is something you have been public about that you wish you hadn't been so open about? Oh, you are an open book. I'm not even going to front. You are a very open book. I'm too open, probably. Um, I would like tell anyone anything, <laughs> I think. But then it's also funny because I do think I'm kind of private in ways. Maybe not. Or maybe I just feel private because I only share when I'm ready. Um, but they always say in writing, you have to take, like, you have to be out of it to write about it. Because if you're writing about it in it, and this is what happened. When I moved back from LA, I was trying to write about it. I wrote, you know, we all do this now when we move to a new chapter of our lives. You like think, and I think, was it us, Natty and Shay? I don't know. I was talking to someone about this. Like you sometimes think in forms of like, this sounds so bad, but Instagram posts, like you're like, I have to announce this to everyone. And so literally that whole month before I left LA, I was like rewriting what I would say over and over and over Mm -hmm. because, but I found myself explaining myself. And so I didn't like that because I shouldn't have to explain myself to anyone. 
but I knew I wanted to tell my story. And so I really had to sit in that for, it's been six months since I moved back. I had to sit in that and know what's me explaining myself versus me just telling my story. And so I didn't really write about my move until that dreams essay that I wrote. And I still feel like it's not even everything that was going on in my head as to why I moved. And so that was just to answer part of the question. Um, but I think the biggest thing, well, one, I, I don't regret sharing anything ever. I don't think, um, unless someone like digs something up, <laughs> please don't cancel I'm me. I'm not going to cancel um, you. Please don't cancel <laughs> me. Um, or I'll just say sorry. Cause that's what people should do when you offend someone. I mean, I don't, I literally will try my whole life not to offend anyone, but if I have, I just say sorry, like everyone should be doing. Um, but anyways, that really went off on a side note, but I think the biggest thing is to not regret what I've said or done. Um, and then I think the hardest thing um, is just trying not to explain myself about LA and realizing that um, that took me a while to open up about because I really felt like people um, were going to just put their own opinions on me and try and decide. It, it, I felt like it didn't matter what I said. My reason for moving back was it would only, it wouldn't matter to people. They would they wouldn't believe what I said. They believe what they think about my situation. Like oh, you just gave up on your dream, or oh, you don't want to live here, oh, you're moving back for your boyfriend. So I, I felt stuck, because I just felt like no one believed me no matter what I said about it. Yeah. So I was really quiet about it for a while, because um, I just just felt like I knew I needed to do it, but I, I didn't expect other people to understand. And so that was really hard um, for a while. I, I think that answered the question. <laughs> that yeah. was a really good question. How admirable <laughs> was it for you, again, finding strength within yourself of being like, this is what I feel like is best for me. Like, mm -hmm. no is a complete statement. I have to do what's best for me. And here you are growing and glowing in ways that only you can do for yourself. You can only put yourself in the proper uh, soil and the proper environment. So cheers to you. Yes. Yeah. We love to see it. <laughs> um, Jane asked, what did you discover about the woman you are and the woman you want to become while writing this book? Um, ooh, that's good. I think the woman I am is, is like all in these pages, I think, because every experience, you're an onion, every layer, every year you grow into who you are. Um, I think the biggest thing I learned is that, um, well, one, I have to be a woman of my word now. I've always tried to live by integrity. You know, the newspaper test we learned in school, like if you don't want it on the front page of a newspaper, don't do it. Yeah. I always try to live that way, but really it's all in a book now. So I have to constantly be reminding myself all these reminders and I have to live by it. Um, that's the biggest thing. But I think also everything in life doesn't have to be a statement. It can be a question. And I think a lot of these are questions. And I think questions are gentle and they're soft, but they're also rude awakenings because the person asking it can't answer it for you. Only you can answer it, but they're just basically putting life in a new light for you, for you to examine what does this mean to you? Um, and so I think I'm really gonna start leading my life with more questions, not answers, and exploring rather than trying to answer things from my own life and just really being okay with the process. Um, so that's really, I think, what I learned about myself. Yeah, through all of this. Wow, growing. Growth is, uh, it's just <sighs> so uncomfortable but what an amazing thing like a year from now you're gonna be like wow I really did what that <laughs> that's what I did I wrote a whole book you know um but it, it is super inspiring and encouraging to see people kind of destroy the person they used to be in order to be a new person you know yeah. um Michael said how are you feeling about writing right now are you still writing if so what is next Oh my gosh. Hi, Michael. I love you. I saw him yesterday. This is my, I think it is. Um, but okay. So what, what am I writing right now? Or how do I feel about writing what I'm writing next? Is that the question? Mm -hmm. How do I feel about writing now? I feel even more compelled to write. I think after the book, I thought I would not want to write for a while because I'd be so sick of it. But <laughs> if I'm just being purely honest, I, yeah. I love this book so much but I've read it so many times. I don't need to see it again right now. So honestly, it's inspired me to move past this onto the next thing rather than just being like, I don't want to write for a while. I'm good. Like I feel that. Um, cause I literally feel like I breathe writing. Like writing is my life. I've blogged mm. since forever. I've written my life since forever. So it's part of me. Um, that's how I feel about writing. Um, I think what's next, what's next in writing 
Honestly, in life. Both. I'm nosy. What's going on with both? (laughs) I love you. Okay, in life, I really want to do a podcast next. So. Listen, if you need a Michael. Michael. Oh, yeah, true. (laughs) Oh, my God. Let's just make make this a podcast. Shay and Mia, and we'll think of a fun name. We can't do Shine On because Reese took that. So, but it's okay. You'll think of something better. You have better names for everything. Um, But definitely a podcast eventually. Um, And then what I'm writing next is I have, so I want to do, as soon as you guys may know, I was like in grad school, but then this happened. It's just been kind of weird. And I also wasn't a fan of the grad school I was at. So I'm trying to transfer. And my thesis is probably going to be my next book because I already have notes. Just how Note to Self was built, except more intentionally, I have notes and notes and notes for my future book. But I wrote those down knowing it'd be a book. So it's just a lot of my life experiences. Um, one is going to be, I don't, I mean, I don't want to give too much away. I don't want to give too much away. I could go on forever, but there's two books. I want to do one. We'll be okay. Well, yeah, you guys will be okay. You Just know that I'm going to have probably like a book of personal essays or a memoir soon. Oh, Not soon, it. probably in like two years, three years, but you know. Listen, there's no rush. Do what you need to do, girl. We're waiting. <laughs> oh, oh patiently. We're waiting patiently. Um, David said, as you begin compiling everything for the book, what was the most rewarding and most difficult part about revisiting, reliving the memories and stories that inspired you to write down the notes to yourself? Oh Ooh. my gosh, that's really good. Um, I might have to re- repeat that part of that question because I got stuck on the end because that really just got me but I think the most painful thing to relive is I wrote some of these in so much pain like especially the love section so much pain and it's hard like you almost want to like hug your younger self you want to be like oh my god I remember because you know and you know your younger self so I'm one of us are crying like crying thinking about it like I just remember reading some of them and go oh my god I can't believe I wrote that down I was literally hurting so much But I kind of want to hug little me and be like, I remember the moment I felt this, why I felt this, why I wrote this down. But also I just want to hug you and like let you know that it's like, it's going to be okay. But yeah, all up in the love section. Everything else is more of like, F these haters vibe, you know? (laughs) But I think the most painful was definitely in that section. And then um, I think, I think that, did I answer the whole question? Am I missing part of the question? Yeah. Okay. Hi, David. The next question, Shelby asked, what is your biggest hope for your readers upon finishing Note to Self? (gasps) Oh, I love this question. And I kind of said it, but um, I just hope everyone sees themselves in it. I hope you don't walk away thinking like, oh my God, Mia's story is amazing. Her life is amazing. I hope you walk away being like, I'm amazing. Wow. I need to, I need to think about this. Like, how am I going to change my perspective? How am I going to grow today? How far have I come and what did I come from? Um, so I just hope people reflect. Yeah. Yeah. Reflection is hard and uncomfortable. While reading it, uh, there, I think, yeah, the one about fear. Like, it, I wanted to throw the book. I want to be like, yo, this book sucks. Why is she adding me right now? But, like, that's the beauty in reflection. You know what I mean? Being able to be like, wow, I'm in such a different space now than I was in before that's where you truly can appreciate and see the growth, but yeah. knowing that you're growing is uncomfortable and it's really scary. So, so scary. I'm a fan. 12 out of 10 would recommend the book. <laughs> would recommend me. Yes. Leave an Amazon review. Thank you. <laughs> um, another question. What was your favorite part about your self-publishing journey? Ooh. Okay. Self-publishing is a bitch. I can say bitch because this is our webinar and I can say what I want. It is <laughs> hard. Okay. I went in thinking this was easy. Well, one, I went in thinking it was easy because it's a book of freaking quotes. Like how hard can it be? That's why I did this. It was a pandemic. I wanted a book and I was like, let me just curate. Can't be that hard. It was so hard to revise everything. I went through this book so many times. I, oh my gosh, I'm getting like PTSD thinking about it. Oh yay. <laughs> <laughs> so many times. Like I'm a perfectionist. Like redoing the lines, making sure the formatting is good. Do I want it left aligned, right aligned? Like so much time, so much time. Um, Lots of paper cuts. But I think my favorite part is just that I get to say I did this. Like it's comprehensive. I mean, at some points I was jealous because the whole reason I self-published is I was like, 
like I said, who am I to write a book of quotes? I didn't want to go to some agent and be like, hi, I'm 25. You don't know me. I have life lessons. I just wanted it to be untouched. I wanted it to be, of course, I had friends improve them. I, you know, edited some of the quotes, but I didn't want it to be largely impacted by, you know, a, a publicist or an agent yeah. or an editor. Um, and I just wanted it out quick to just be very frank and honest. Like I wanted it to be quick. It was not, like I said, um, but I just, I love that it's mine. And I love that so many people love the cover because I designed this on Canva, really on Canva. It's like so, Canva really is that girl though. It really is. I'm not going to front. Canva is that girl. She really is. So. Get the job done. Yeah. I'm proud. Aw. Okay, well, we have a question from Simone. Hi, Simone. Uh, Hi, Simone. This is a Simone Stan account, 12 out of 10. Um, yes. <laughs> Simone said, what's your advice to aspiring authors out there who want to share their stories and publish their first books but are afraid to make the first step? Oh, my gosh. Do it. Do it. Just, I feel like I'm just talking in cliches, but really I'm just learning so many life cliches are true. Like, you can't think. You don't have, you cannot afford the time to think too hard about it. You have to just do it. Perfect later. But so many people don't even get out of that first stage because they're like scared. Um, I, like I said, I've always, I don't know. I need to calm down. I've never been scared, afraid to take risks. So I don't know how to tell people not to do it or to not be afraid to do it. I really don't, but you just have to, I don't know how else to explain it. Um, and then also I think, I guess people who just want to share their stories is, uh, I don't know, this doesn't really have to do with this question, but I think I should just say it, is that everyone has a book in them. And so many writers and authors say this, all of you, everyone watching this, you could write a book about your life. You may not think it's important enough, but everyone has a book inside of them. It's just not on the page yet. And it's really just about whether like you have to or not. Like, I don't know how else to say it. It's a God feeling, like it's divine. Like you have to get it out. Like you have to write it down. Just like me walking to class and scrambling things in my notes. Like you either have to get it down or you don't. Um, but it's just a matter of, doing taking that first step and just like putting it all out there and then going back and revising and editing but you just yeah right um write down everything in your life too journal you don't have to journal every day you don't have to write like paragraphs but there are times like i'll literally like i started my, writing my screenplay and i went to go write about a scene i was inspired by in my life and i didn't journal about it so i literally can only go back to my memory on it and i don't yeah. have anything actually to go off of so write down something every single day or as soon as something happens to you that you feel like can be worthy of a story, write it down because you'll regret it if you go back and you don't have anything to base it off of. Period. <laughs> Period. Um, I think for me, it's been, I'm a, a scaredy cat. I'm a nervous Nancy and everyone's like, no, you're so brave. I'm like, no, I'm actually sweating, do, like doing anything, <laughs> but kind of throwing myself and flinging myself into the unknown has just given me an immense amount of strength and I see that in you now after writing this like there's so many even during some of our meetings you'll say something you're like oh, I'm not sure oh my goodness and then <laughs> oh, I God, yeah. like, hey, no I do know like I meant to say that I'm like that's my girl absolutely like there's just so much confidence in throwing yourself into the unknown and then making it out on the other side you might get some scratches might be a little bitter about some things but when you kind of come from the other side mm. you just feel like so confident you know and i'm seeing a lot of that in you thanks i feel the same way about you we balance each other out though because you know libra cap like i can't make a decision you can period Period. <laughs> I'm like, Mia, what do you want? What do you want? I'm like, tell me what I want. I don't know. Yeah, even just seeing you do like the book and stuff and us going back and forth and being like, I don't know. What do you got? No, Mia, what do you want? And this, you wanted this. Like, it, uh, I, I don't know. I'm still in such awe that you manifested this. And it wasn't an empty manifestation. There was <gasps> action behind it. You Can know? I show you something? Hold yes. on. Tell us. Hold on. I don't know if I should tap dance while we wait for you, but. What could you possibly be going to get? I know, I should have played some music during this time. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? I should have played some music in the time when you left. <laughs> oh my God, okay, okay. Oh yeah, that bomb playlist, all my hype songs. Okay, so I started vision boards and I was at my darkest space in LA after my first year in LA, I started vision boards, which are so oh, cheesy, but important. 
So this is my one from 2018. I wrote author. Yep. And then this is the one from last year, 2019. No way, I guess it's 20 and then 19. Yeah. And then this one says, write, print, publish, promote. So this is the thing. Ah! It may take two years. You may not even know. I did this not even knowing it'd be note to self. I just knew I wanted to write something and publish it. It may take two years, but you have to manifest it and you have to just put it on your radar. And then even if you get to it in three years, it's like you're always going towards it. It's like the light at the end of the tunnel. So write everything down. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> That's my PSA. We love it. <laughs> Iconic. Um, I don't want to say his name wrong. Monice? Monice? Yes, it's my mom. Wow. We stand her too from afar. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> we love you, mom. Your mom's like, oh, leave me alone too. Um, <laughs> yes, you've accomplished so much. Oh, I also want to start out. I am obsessed with how big of fans your parents are. Like, what a blessing. Thank you. Your parents have always been cheerleaders for you, you know, championing for champ, championing for you, excuse me. Um, but she said you've, you've accomplished so much in your 25 years. Is note to self your favorite accomplishment? <gasps> you know, haven't had enough time to think about it. But now that you say it, <laughs> I think so. I think so. Yeah. I would say so. It's mine. Like, I just, yeah. I, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's nice because all the other accomplishments, it's like something you did at work for somebody else's company or like yeah. for someone else. So this is like online, which is nice. For you. I think we have another family member here. C. Oh, that's my dad. Hi, dad. Icon. Another icon. <laughs> um, he said, is there anything in the book that you regret? <laughs> you don't understand. This is such a C question. Oh my gosh. You're so funny, dad. Um, anything in the book I regret? Not yet. I might. Why yet? Life changes. If this has taught me anything, it's that none of these could be true in like 10 years, which is so scary. You made I a book of lies, Mia? No. Maybe. It's like, this is the thing is like life, and I guess maybe not because there's one quote that's like, you can change your, you're allowed to change your viewpoint, you're allowed to grow. But it's just like so much of what I thought life was about or what was important in life isn't the same isn't on the same priority list to me now so it's yeah. like even though these are so tr and I, I a part of the book like I promoted it as like these are thoughts I found to be true at different stages of my life because they were true at different stages of my life but I hope that some of these I mean I think it's a good baseline but I'm sure there'll be one or two that I'm like I don't know if I necessarily think that way anymore like I don't know if I'm trying to think people suck yourself not excluded I think that's a humbling one and we all need to remember that. But what if like one day I'm like, no, I don't believe that. Or, you know, I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just rambling now. But maybe there's something that I'll literally be like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I feel that way anymore. So, but nothing which, right now. No. Yeah. Which will probably happen, which has probably happened. I a thousand percent was like, I'm going to marry Zac Efron. <laughs> By the looks of it, a girl maybe might not marry. <laughs> Him, you know, but to say that that could change in like a day or a year. Whatever. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'd still, I'd still. Dan is watching probably, but he agrees. I'd still. So. I respect it. Um, Emily said, Did you experience any writer's block while writing the book, or did it feel supernatural since it was a collection of quotes over the year? And how do you get over writer's block? Wow, that's a great question. Thanks, Emily. Um, hey, girl. Um, 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 I never know how to answer the question about writer's block because the truth is I'm backlogged. There's just, I have ideas dating back to like 10 years ago and it's just me living life and being busy. And I'm like, one day I'm going to write that screenplay. One day I'm going to do this. Like a writer. Truly, really, like, I don't know. I guess I get writer's block when I sit down and I like can't figure out a scene, but like, I never am like running out of ideas, if that makes sense. Um, but I did get writer's block in this mostly because, and I said it in acknowledgments to all my friends who helped me edit this. I said, words tend to make sense inside the heart and the head. Thank you for helping them make sense on the page. It's a lovely thing to have friends with like you. Truly, because some of these make sense. They were just, I was writing them down as I went. They weren't really making sense to anyone else. I only wrote them for me. So it makes sense to me, but it was funny to send it out and then see how many people were like, I don't get that. And I'm like, oh, I gotta change that to make sense. So I kept the essence of the quote but had to make it clear. And there was a few, if my mom was still watching, 
I would go back and forth with her. I remember one day we sat and we were like, I think it was the like, uh, not dimming your light for someone else quote. I can't think of it exactly, but basically like how to word that in a way that made sense. We were going back and forth and I was like, I don't know, this, this really makes no sense. So that was when I had the most word block and I would basically, like I get through anything, I just talk to my mom about it. <laughs> Be like, please help me, I don't know. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. But yeah, some of them had to make sense and I had to ask for help because I didn't know how else to make them clear, so. That's so sweet. I still have, I don't know if you remember when we were working at NBC together. Oh yes, I do. <laughs> we were, <laughs> what a time. What a time to be alive. <laughs> That's true. Um, but no, seriously. Um, I remember that we were both super frustrated about not having what we wanted um, professionally, mm -hmm. personally. Mm -hmm. And I, um, we were talking and kind of just venting to each other. And then I was like, you know, my dad always tells me a closed mouth never gets fed. Like, if you don't ask for what you want, you will never get it. And people I, don't assume that they'll meet your needs. I remember, I can, do you ever remember life in, like, pictures? I can yeah, remember you telling me that for the first time. How scary is that? We literally were sitting on a rock by the pond at NBC, and you told me that. And I was like, this girl, this girl, she's so wise. And I held yeah. on to that. A closed mouth doesn't get fed. You gotta ask gotta ask and then if the answer is no then you go somewhere else to find food you know you got to keep it pushing mm. open. um but wow girl this book like not only am I just a fan it, it it feels like a timeline of a friendship it feels like a timeline of growth it feels like an evolution in sentences because at first reading it and trying to prep for this interview I'm just like oh how am I supposed to answer questions about some damn food but it feels like life, you know? It feels like my early 20s. It feels like my late teens. It feels as, like, the pages turn on, my life does, too. So, again, I could go on and on about this book, guys. I'm so – I'm not sorry, actually. Um, another question. Bay, Bia? Bay, Bo? B. It's B. 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 Hi, B. Sorry. Um, what section of notes to self, dreams, people, life, self, did you find brought your greatest reckoning or aha moments? What was your most joyful part of the journey? Wow. I think dreams. That's why it's the first one. It's my favorite of all the chapters because I felt the most growth in it. And I think I ha have had the most transformation in regards to like my dream my career, what I want for myself, how am I like to look in work and out of work. And so I think I definitely had the most pivotal realizations in dreams. Um, but also people was just fun to write because I feel like I was like dragging people, but then I also was dragging myself. So that was the most fun. Um, I, I shouldn't say write because like I said, like it wasn't like I was like, ah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write these, but going back through them and like positioning them. That was the fun. realizations at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun. So yeah. yeah that makes more sense. Okay. Here you are published book chilling. What would you tell baby Mia? What would you, if you could go back and talk to 16 year old Mia, what would you say? Oh my gosh. I would just say like, well, I, I say this in the book. And it's literally because people ask me all the time, like, what would you ask your younger self? And I literally say nothing, nothing at all. I would just let it all be because I don't want to know what I know now. Um, I think it would scare me. Mm -hmm. I think I would try to change my life trajectory. I think I would fight it. I think that's all the fun in life is learning along the way. And I, I really, I just wouldn't tell myself anything. I would just be like, you're on the right path. Like, keep it up. Keep going. Keep doing you. Um, so I was yeah, was a writer, a content creator, a host, a Jill of all trades. Um, what, <laughs> what kind of, no, literally, a Jill of all trades. You're what so kind, funny. What kind of legacy do you want to leave? Like, when you are gone and your time is done on earth, what do you want people to remember you for? Oh, that question. What do I want people to remember me for? Dang, I don't. I don't know. I never think in terms of this. Maybe I should start thinking this way more, but I think what I want, 
I just want people to like live their lives and live their lives being them. I think so many people aren't true to themselves and that makes me really sad. Mm. That makes me really, 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 really sad when people aren't following their hearts, aren't doing what they they need to be doing. Yeah. I just want people to live their truths no matter what that looks like. Even when the world is like telling you like, you suck. That's not okay. That's not right. Like, no, I'm here for you. No, I'll accept you any way you are. And yeah, I just, I just hope I inspire people to live their lives as fully as possible and as real as possible. And I hope the same for myself. Um, Cause my favorite quote ever since this is book of quotes is um, by Gandhi and it's my life is my message. So the legacy I hope to live is just like the way I live my life. So. Hmm. <laughs> Iconic. Iconic. We love to see it. Um, <gasps> Everyone put that on your Instagram bios right now. My life is my message. <laughs> You're like, and give me credit or I'm going to sue. Come on, you're freaking for a lawyer. Oh my gosh. Um, so your book is um, sectioned off. Yeah, your book is into different sections. What is the hardest lesson you've had to learn about love and family? <gasps> love and family? Love and So separately, like what is the hardest okay. lesson you've learned about family? And, and I'm interested because you, your family dynamics feel so wholesome. Of course, no family's perfect. Yeah. But, um, yeah. And also love seeing you and Dan and seeing your journey of becoming the young woman you are. Like, what was the hardest lesson? Oh, my Give gosh. Gosh. It's so funny, too, because I remember when I said this with one of my friends, Bethany literally was like, she was like, I feel like the love section is not a lot of love. It's just a lot of heartbreak. And I was like, yeah. Because I was like literally most of my life until like the past few years with Dan. But um, I think, okay, the, the hardest lesson, that's a really good question. The hardest lesson I learned, I think, with, I'll go with like, I'll break love into heartbreak and then like love right now. With heartbreak is that like, I think for a long time, I was like trying to ascribe anyone who broke my heart as like a bad person with bad intentions, mm. who sucks. And I really just came to the realization of like, I cannot be mad at them. Like I, you just can't, you can't be mad at someone for changing their mind. You can't be mad at someone for not knowing what they want, even though it's frustrating. Like they aren't bad people. They just made bad decisions. And I just had to learn to let it go. And that is the hardest thing because I am a Libra and I stay wanting to hold a grudge. I stay wanting to hate people who like, literally, you know us, like we're cool. If you mess with us, we, you literally are on our list forever. Um, so I think it's been nice to kind of like, just let go. I also think meeting like the love of my life helped. <laughs> so, um, but I think the biggest thing I learned is that in love is that, hmm, it's so weird because I know Dan's watching. Um, I think the biggest thing I, I've learned in love is that I mean, it sounds cheesy, but I think finding someone who you want to wake up with every day and you want to go to sleep with at the end of every night that you want to fight with because you guys fight well and that you want to love with because you just love each other so wholly, um, that is really important. And I think it's all you can ask for. And um, yeah. I think that's the biggest thing. I think a lot of the things I learned from my parents though, cause they are, they've been together for 20 years and they're very much in love. So that was, um, very much what I wanted for my life. Yeah. But I also think that's funny. This is a natural transition into family is <laughs> I wonder what text I'll get from mom and dad after this. But I think also <laughs> part of it is realizing that no matter all the good things, all the bad things, I always say like, I'm scared cause my parents, I feel like they really did nothing wrong, which is like scary because they were always so happy and loved us and loved each other. Um, I think also realizing that like, you can't idolize a certain version of love. You have to find out what that version of love is for you. Mm-hmm. And that's so important because my parents had a seemingly perfect relationship and they do now and they genuinely do. Like they're disgusting, they love each other. It's, oh my God, I get text from my friends every day. Like it's a picture of Moniz and C. I'm like, I get it, I get it. But also knowing that like, even in this permanent seemingly perfect relationship I have to find out what that means to me because what if my parents didn't like each other and they got divorced would I then would I want to emulate that either so I can't want to emulate perfect love I have to find out what that is to me and um yeah did that make any sense yeah uh 
We love it. Iconic parents and iconic writer. We have to stand. <laughs> But that kind of concludes the Q&A. Well, thank you so much for sitting and chatting with me. We're going to head over to the wrap part with Maddie. Yes. Uh, sorry. Um, well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, everyone who submitted their quotes. Um, I think email people and then tell them who won the raffle just because I want Mia to be able to get a chance to take a look at it as well. But um, yes. I'll email people the winners. So thank you, everybody. And thank you, Shay and Mia, for doing this. It was such a good interview. You guys did so great. Um, and if you guys have any questions, feel free to email us. But that's yes. it. And we should say, too, the raffles are, um, it's going to be stickers. So three people are going to win um, free stickers. And so we'll just get your address and everything. We'll probably randomize them. Um, we won't play favorites, but we'll just, we're just going to put them in a system, everybody who attended and stayed the whole time. And then you'll get a sticker and you'll find out if you win. But yeah, thank you guys for giving an hour and some of your time. That's really special. Time is hard to give away. So I thank you guys. And I thank you, Shay, my dear friend, Maddie, my dear friend. They literally volunteered for this. You guys don't even understand. Like, I searched, I think Megan is here too, who's my assistant, who helped me through all this. So hi, Megan. But I literally was like, I want to hire someone. And then Shay and Maddie literally just pulled up. Like they were like, yo, how can I help? And that is amazing. So I want to give props to you guys. Thank you so much. I gen, when I say I genuinely wouldn't be able to do this without you. You already know. You already <laughs> know. So yeah. Thank Thanks you. for letting me be a part of your tribe. Oh, yes, same. And I loved meeting everybody else from it on the team. So can't complain. It's amazing. And thank you, everybody else, for joining us. Yes, Have a good rest you. of your day, night, wherever you are. Oh, and watch, watch my show at 8 p.m. on TV Co. Download yeah, the app. Definitely. So it's the first show tonight. See you there. <laughs>